diversity is the number of individuals in a population that can be supported for a really, really long time. We often say indefinitely by the environment. So that it means that there's very little environmental re resistance in terms of what every organism needs, space, food, light. Predator balance is good. Parasite, Parasite balance is low. Everybody's in a pretty good place, but if you add more to the population, things might get uncomfortable, meaning environmental resistance may kick in. So there's not a lot of room at the carrying capacity for exponential growth. Everybody's kind of doing pretty good. So to kind of keep going with that, one of the things about carrying capacity, usually when you have short-lived species, so remember that in the last lecture, we had talked about yearly cycles, very specific of the Midwest, like we are here, where we have really good conditions in April, May, June, after a really long period of having not much availability of water, locked up in cold, cold temperatures. Our sunlight is very low in terms of the hours of the day through the, win through the winter time. So in the winter, just trying to survive, conditions are good. These short-lived species, like plants, for example, they are going to have a, a period of exponential growth, J-shaped curve, very good biotic potential here. We call that the boom growth period. Maybe about end of summer, days are starting to get shorter again, which means less sunlight. Water availability is getting a little lower. Temperatures are getting a little bit colder. Everything has been growing really well over the summer, so predators may be also high here. And so then you might see a period, or we will, I shouldn't say might, you will see a period of bust so that you see that the population goes down. And then again, carrying capacity through the winter, you can see here. This is really what the carrying capacity in the environment can handle. And then things are very different when you have that very favorable period. So it's a little bit weird in terms of carrying capacity. And we have a little bit difference here, but you can see this is really what the environment can support for the majority of the year and then a different situation here. This is photosynthetic bacteria. So with photosynthetic bacteria, so we're thinking about we're thinking about the pond, for example, or Lake Michigan, where you're going to have bacteria. Again, you're seeing these cycles happen in areas of the world where you have seasons. Photosynthetic bacteria are going to have a lot more favorable conditions, warm, light, nutrients, lots of availability of good stuff, the boom, and the bus. We could see these boom and bust cycles over very long periods of time, but again, you see them, right? Up and down. So like something that has seasons, you might see that a population has exponential growth for a while. Whatever factors in that area of environmental resistance kick in, and then they have that crash. Now that the population is low, all of those things that couldn't support a big population can support a small population. So then again, you see that exponential growth, but then environmental resistance kicks in and kills them back down. Not completely, they start to go up. So hopefully that makes sense that you might see these regular cycles of up and down in some populations like guinea pigs here or whatever that guy is, looks like a guinea pig, something that lives in the Canadian Arctic. One of the things that might make this happen regularly is that this population might be able to reproduce really, really quickly 
when situation or the environment is good and so that they can add to their population really fast and get overcrowded really quickly. Ideally, what we want to see in a population, and it's not always going to be true, is that you have that exponential growth. So we're looking at green, the exponential growth, things start to get uncomfortable because of environmental resistance, and then the population goes up and down at a low level and that the carrying capacity is hovered around over a long period of time. But that's kind of ideal population ecology and not normally true. This is more characteristic of long-lived species who have, like us, well, I don't want to say humans. We are a long-lived species. Let's say something that is more natural, like moose, for example, or wolves, that they're not going to pop out a ton of babies when conditions are good. They're still going to only pop out maybe one or a few at a time. And so that when it gets a little bit crowded, they're not going to go way past the carrying capacity like a short-lived species might do. So there is a big difference between like short-lived species, they can add to the population quickly and then go way past the carrying capacity quickly as opposed to a short-lived, excuse me, these are, I'm talking about those that can reproduce quickly can go past the carrying capacity quickly, whereas something that doesn't have as many babies, it can't go very quickly past the carrying capacity. Jake, did you have a question? Okay. Okay, so again, carrying capacity, maximum number. Oh, wait, and we got past that, sorry. Okay. So now we're going to get into a little more specifics about environmental resistance. I know I've been mentioning it over and over again, so let's get more specific. And I've been saying that environmental resistance are factors that will counteract or work against biotic potential. Remember, biotic potential, the potential of the living things, the potential of the bio. Environmental resistance are factors that are going to stop the living things from getting bigger and bigger in size. They're going to stop that J-shaped curve somehow. At some point, what you do see and what we saw in our different graphs was we eventually see a crash, a bust, or we see some kind of stabilization. The stabilization could be around the carrying capacity or it could be lower than the carrying capacity. If they totally crash, they could go extinct. There are always limits to natural populations. And again, we'll talk about the human population and how we can and have figured out how to exceed our limits. And you guys will have a discussion you'll work on next week about what is our limit? Where is our limit? Are we at our limit? Are we not? Who knows? You guys will talk to each other about it and do some research. Environmental resistance factors, as I've mentioned, can be things like parasites, crowding, disease. A lot of times these will go together. When you have a lot more individuals, you will often have the spread of disease and parasites quicker. We can definitely see that in populations as you have, like for example, if you live in a house alone, you don't have the ability to catch a cold from someone else very easily, unless you're inviting a lot of people into your house. But if you're in your house, you don't have people over, you're not gonna catch a cold in your house. However, if you live in a house and nine other people live there with you, they're out in the world bringing home their interactions with others, the chances of you getting a cold are much, much higher, right? So as crowding increases, your exposure goes way up for parasites and diseases. Also, if you have crowding, one of the factors that can happen is emigration. Organisms might go, ah, this doesn't feel so good. Let's pick a small group and go somewhere else. So they might emigrate 
and they might start a new population elsewhere where it's more comfortable. Having less access to resources can cause species or individuals in that species to die, can cause individuals in that species to die at a younger age. And then also you might have the issue of if you're not comfortable in your environment, your first mode is survival, your second mode is reproduction. So if you are not comfortable in your environment, you're like, ah, I gotta do what I can do to survive. You're not thinking, I'm so uncomfortable, I wanna have sex. Not gonna happen, right? So reproduction may go down. So let's talk a little bit about stabilization, which is not necessarily a reality. You don't see a population who is completely stable where they stay at the same numbers every single year. You do see, again, moving around that carrying capacity or you do see no stabilization and you see that crash or that bust. So stabilization is when in natural populations they will hover close to the carrying capacity. Again, remember carrying capacity, the maximum number in an environment that can be supported for a really long period of time means that resources are highly available, parasites, disease, predators, crowding, all down. So we have this long-term state of equilibrium. That equilibrium, again, it's not gonna be exactly the same year to year, but that equilibrium is gonna hover up and down. Zero population growth means that over an extended period of time, you do see an equilibrium average happening. We generally do not see this again every year. Same amount come in as come out, same amount die as are born. Rarely ever see that in a natural population, but maybe over 20 years. You might see hmm, it's kind of hovering at about zero. So in reality, zero population growth is a long-term idea. Organisms that have equilibrium are usually long-lived organisms. As you guys were exposed to this in lab, we call this type one survivorship. And usually it means the situation is really good for those long-lived organisms, that they come to a new area, they learn how to utilize the resources in that area without going too crazy and doing that exponential growth. Maybe they go past their carrying capacity a little bit, go down in the next five years, come up in the next five years and do that kind of over time. We have that average of no growth in the population. What we find happening when we graph this is that you do have biotic potential. So biotic potential meaning that you do have that swing up in growth. They go a little above the carrying capacity and make a curve and then come back down. And so when we graph that, it looks like an S. So we call that an S-shaped curve or a logistic curve. So here, when we were looking at those graphs before, here was that last graph or the green one. And we do, we do call this biotic potential still because it is an exponential growth factor, right? We go low and we go really high. And then maybe they get close to the carrying capacity, maybe they go a little over. But this mimics the shape of the letter S. That's why we call it an S-shaped curve. Remembering that your equilibrium state is caused by environmental resistance. That at some point things get a little bit uncomfortable and so everything slows down. So here's that green graph alone that you saw with the other two earlier. So again, remember, carrying capacity, maximum number of individuals in a population that can be supported indefinitely or over a long period of time. We have certain factors that are going to determine this. Renewable resources. 
So what can we replenish through natural processes like photosynthesis? If you have tons and tons of food, so you move into a new area and there's all this food there for you, if you don't plan ahead as a population and think, how are we going to find more food or grow more food, then you're going to be in trouble, right? You want to keep those renewable resources going. So that's part of the process. Inorganic nutrients, air, other things that are in the soil. How are we going to support our photosynthesizers? Water, really important for both our photosynthesizers as well as for our own bodies, and sunlight also to support photosynthesis. Non-renewable resources you have to be careful with also, and that's what we're talking about, like space. You only have so much space in a population. So if we're looking at a population out on the prairie, the prairie is only so big, and then it is confined by a road, another road, a building, and a parking lot. Can the birds out there make more prairie? No, they're confined, right? So space would be a non-renewable resource. They can't get more of it. So again, environmental resistance. It falls into two main categories. So environmental resistance, the first category is density independent. These factors do not rely on how big the population is. Doesn't matter how big your population is, these things are going to have an effect. So they can hurt a population of 10, they can hurt a population of a billion. Doesn't matter how many are in the population, they're going to have an effect. And we're gonna come back to a little more examples about that. Then you have density dependent. These things are gonna have a greater effect on larger densities. So bigger the population, the effect is going to increase. We're going to look at these a lot in the next lecture on community ecology. Other organisms are going to have a big effect on your population. All right, so density independent factors, weather. If there is an explosion of a volcano, doesn't matter. You could have two individuals, they could get totally wiped out. You could have a billion individuals that lava is going to wipe them out. A lot of organisms have adaptations or they have behaviors that they do to try and avoid these things. With weather, for example, you have a lot of birds that migrate. Weather being a huge factor that is independent of the size of a population that birds like to be in weather that's warm. There's lots of food. There's lots of sunlight. So what birds do is they start up in Canada, and as the weather starts to get colder, they fly south for the winter, right? So they fly, they fly, and they go all the way down to South America. When it starts to warm up in Canada, they're like, oh, it's good back up there. I'm going to make my way back up there again. And so they have these adaptations where they can fly across the world to make sure that they are in conditions that are good for them. Human activities are another one. Let's say that prairie, we've got tons of species out in that prairie, and the college says, we need another parking lot. Everybody's gone. There's nothing they can do about it. I mean, some of them might fly away fly away quickly, but for the most part, if you're there when the bulldozers come, you're out of luck. Another thing is that how we treat the area, let's say that our prairie, that they decide they don't like a lot of the plants out there, 
So they start to put out pesticides, or I should say, they don't like the mosquitoes. So they put a lot of pesticides out there. Those toxins will kill off a lot of species out in the prairie. And then also just pollution. The organisms out there have adapted to cars and the fumes of cars that happen here on our campus. Density dependent factors. So these are gonna be things that have an effect on a larger population. So one example is predation. If you're a population of 10, you can be really sneaky and better avoid predators because as if you have, let's say, a bunch of squirrels and there's out of 10 individuals in their population, there's three young squirrels, the parents can communicate, okay, you need to be real quiet. Or the parents can plan to move around when the young ones are sleepy so that they will be quiet. Easier to evade your predator or something that's going to eat you if you have a small population, right? You can go a little bit more unseen. You can plan a little better with a small population. If we have a thousand squirrels and they're like, uh-oh, we got to move somewhere, is it easy to be unseen? No, right? So a larger population is going to be easily spotted by predators. We do see this relationship between predators and prey. Predators will eat their prey. Prey is a thing getting eaten by the predator. There's been a study done from about 1840 to 1940. So we have 100 years where scientists studied this population of hares, like bunny rabbits, and lynx, which is a, a medium-sized cat. The lynx is a medium-sized cat. And so what they did was they tracked the hare population, but they also tra tracked the relationship to the lynx population. And so what they found is if we look at the beginning of the study, the hare population, which is in blue, moves into an area. They have really good biotic potential. They start to go up. As they start to get larger in size, guess who spots them more easily? The lynx. So now the lynx population, as they start to grow, the bunny population grows, the lynx population is like, ooh, lots of food. So they start to increase too. Now once the predators get really high, the prey, you can see, they go down. For some reason, they start to go up a little bit. But when the predator population is at its highest, so are they, and then they both start to decrease. The predators start to eat a lot of them. But now as they start to decrease, as the prey population decreases, there's less food for the predators, so they decrease. Both populations are low. You see that the prey population starts to go up, and the predators are like just behind that. They lag or they follow just behind and go, oh, lots of food. Lots of food here, lots of predators. Food population starts to go down. Predator population goes down. So you see that they are very similar graphs, but the red graph follows the blue graph just by a little bit. So they do have an effect on one another. This was another study with weevils and wasps. So we have, again, the prey population goes up. Shortly thereafter, predator population goes up. Lots of predators kill off the prey. Not much more food when the prey is low. Prey population goes up. Predator so shortly thereafter goes up. So if we took the blue and we moved it over a little bit, it would be almost exactly the red. Another issue of density-dependent environmental resistance is parasites. Viruses, bacteria are also considered parasites. I know when we think of parasites, we might think of worms, for example. 
but really good examples are viruses and bacteria as well. The idea of a parasite is that you want to keep your host, the thing you're living in or on, alive for a really long time so that you can keep living. So for example, if you live at home with your parents, you could think of yourself as the parasite and your parents as the host. If your parents are super nice and they give you things like a place to live, food, maybe pay for your cell phone, let you use a car, is it a good idea to kill them? No, right? You want to kind of keep them happy as long as you can. You want to keep them giving you what you need. So parasites typically try and go unseen. They try and take from their host without killing them. Just like typical virus and bacteria is that they want to live off of the individual that they're infecting without totally killing them. So again, this is kind of like, I think when we think about parasites, we think about something like a tapeworm, but could be, again, viruses and bacteria are really good examples. We're gonna get into competition in the next unit as well, or I'm sorry, in the next chapter as well. But this is also a form of density dependent environmental resistance. So the bigger the population, again, the worse it's gonna be. Competition is when individuals are interacting and competing for a limited resource. So let's say in this class, oh, hey, I forgot to tell you all. I only give out one A and everybody else gets an F. Would that change how pleasant the class is? Yeah, you guys might start telling each other like, hey, there's no exams in this class. Don't even worry, right? Or she moved the exam to next week. You might start lying, sabotaging each other, right? I don't do that. You earn what you earn, by the way. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about survivorship now getting back to what we talked about in the Population Ecology Lab. So survivorship are the number of individuals that are surviving over a period of time, over an age group, over an interval. So if you remember from lab, we had that X group. And depending on what our species was that we were studying, whether it was the bubbles or the dice, it might have been years, it might have been seconds. So some kind of interval or group number is our X. And then we were looking over a period of time. Survivorship, if you remember from lab, was that L of X, the percent that survive in a specific interval. What this shows, and I always like, <laughs> this is always funny to me. Survivorship, survivorship can be either, I don't know, glass half full, half empty, right? I always say the percent that survive. You could also look at it as the opposite, the percent that die. So if we say survivorship was 90% for this interval, we could also say deaths were 10% in this interval. You could look at it both ways. I like to look at the positive. So we have three types of curves. When you analyze your graphs, you're gonna look at, is my graph constant loss, uh, sorry, late loss, constant loss, or early loss? Type, type one, type two, type three. Okay, so late loss, type one. Very low juvenile death rate. Most individuals survive to old age. So the offspring or the babies survive and they live a long life. This would be a convex survivorship curve. Start out with not many, many survive to old age. Out of these organisms in front of you, which one would this be most characteristic of? Yeah, of us, right? We have offspring, they usually survive to old age.
Type 1 survivorship is characteristic of long-lived animals. Again, typically animals, not all organisms, but animals. They're usually the bigger animals. And let's think about this then. So why would most organisms survive to old age if they are type 1 survivorship? Is it because individuals have many offspring and they don't get protected? Or is it because each individual has few offspring and they are protected early in life? Good. Yeah, I see a lot of nodding on that one. Yeah, most when we're talking about type 1 survivorship, there's not that many offspring. And so those few offspring are taken really good care of early in life so that they do make it to older age. Not necessarily just true of humans, but a lot of larger animals, especially mammals. Yeah, right, exactly. Elephants do, it's a good example too. All right, constant loss. This one's kind of crazy. So this is type two. There's a pretty consistent death rate. If you are a type two survivorship organism, every day, every minute of your life, you are saying, I could die right now. I could die right now. I could die right now. You don't know. Could be, there's like, it's a line. And so every day, like could be now, could be now, could be now. So every day something is dying in your population. Could be you, could be the organism next to you. So it kind of stinks to be that. So you're a, line. you're a straight line. You just don't know if today is your day or not. All right, so why is this? As I mentioned before, birds and migration, typically as a bird, you're kind of on your own. You might travel with another bird, a mate, or likely by yourself. And so if you think about it, if you're flying from Canada and in one day you're going 100 miles to somewhere else, do you know what the situation is going to be like as a bird at that 100 mile mark where you're going to rest? No, right? You don't know what the food situation is. You don't know what the housing situation is. You don't know what the predator situation is. So when you get there, you're, it's all a surprise. Could you die? Maybe. Could you survive? Maybe. So these type of organisms that do migrations or have really major adaptations to their environment, it's all a crapshoot on what's ahead of them. Other things that reproduce asexually, hydras, a lot of the little organisms that live out in the pond or the little organisms that live on the surface of the ocean. You don't know what the temperature change is gonna be today, the currents. Weather could change, hurricane could come. So there's a lot of unknowns in your day. Early loss is type three. So this is the total opposite of type one. Death rate is usually really, really high. If you can make it past the juvenile phase of your life, you will probably live really, really, really old. But those first, kind of that growing period to just past being a juvenile, it's real static. Concave survivorship curve. Lots of individuals in the population up high. So lots of babies and then a lot of deaths. Usually, this is characteristic of organisms that have a lot of babies at once. So we're talking about fish. We're talking about a lot of organisms that live in the ocean. Coral, sea urchins, worms, insects. Insects pump out a lot. Plants are another one. So it's not just reserved to animals. Plants send out a lot of pollen, and they hope that they're going to have a baby plant down somewhere out there. Lots of babies, no parental care, maybe a little bit, most likely none. 
A lot of these organisms, they have their offspring and then their offspring go, uh, go somewhere else. If we think about things that live in the ocean, their eggs usually end up floating away. And the eggs develop on their own and hope for the best. Can you imagine humans if we had a baby and you just plopped it down and we're like, good luck, kid. Would we survive? <laughs> no, right? Anything that's type 1 wouldn't deal with this. These organisms have really major adaptations for survival. As soon as they're born, adaptations kick in. They know how to survive as a one-day-old organism. We don't do that, right? I think even like me, I'm still figuring it out. So, Deer do this often. Deer more so because the population is influenced by human activities. Think about like here. Deer have to deal with cars on roads. That's really tough. So that's why this case, a mammal, fits in here. But mostly long-lived big species mammals are type 1. Mice, right, yeah, mice are another one. Yeah, they would definitely fit in here. Smaller mammals would fit in here. Mm -hmm. Talked about things in the ocean, invertebrates in the ocean, insects on land, worms, invertebrates. I mentioned plants, too. Okay, so here again you can see that with humans, that we have very few make it to old age. You have lots of organisms early on. When you're talking type three, a lot of them die. The death rate, whew, death rate is really high, meaning that you don't have many organisms past the juvenile stage. And those that you do have a really long life. Again, plants are a good example, right? Saplings. Not many make it to becoming a big tree. And then, as I mentioned, any organisms where they don't know what's going to happen that day. Environment is really chaotic, like birds, for example. This always like to point out, this um, was in our old textbook that they made the man running and make to illustrate late loss. I was like, what is that choice about? Another good example to think about dandelions in terms of type 3. All of these are seeds. You take a dandelion and you blow, each one of those little floaties could be a new organism. Probably a thousand on here. How many of them are going to actually become plants? Maybe 10 out of that thousand. We do see a lot of dandelions, but they have a really good strategy, right? Each plant can make 20 of these in a summer times a thousand there so they try and pump out as many flowers with babies on there as possible so that they can keep surviving good strategy because we see a lot of them okay so now humans we do not fit the normal principles of population ecology we have come up with all kinds of ways to deflect things environmental resistance that make us uncomfortable. So let's talk about it. We have an exponential growth. Ever since the Industrial Revolution, when we figured out technology of food, meaning agriculture, building, transportation, medicine, all of these technological advances came together and then our population went like, ooh, it's hard. We got all kinds of survival modes. We have technology. Other organisms, they don't have that. The deer out there, are the deer creating bridges to go over our roads? No, they don't know how to do that. So they get hit by cars. But we can figure out a bridge to get over a stream a river to make it easier to get around. We can figure out how to combat bacteria. Look how fast we are figuring out how to combat the coronavirus, COVID-19. 
I read an article in the New York Times and it said that the, the coronavirus, COVID-19, is the most researched virus on the planet. And a lot of people, you know, a lot of the arguments against uh, getting vaccinated are, well, there's just not a lot of research done. That's not true. There's more research done on this virus than any virus ever has been in the past. And so they're comparing similar viruses, similar vaccines, and that does actually make our technology in regard to it much safer, as opposed to 100 years ago, when they were trying to get the measles vaccine, they didn't know a lot. But this we have tons of research on. So it's really interesting that not only the technology in terms of researching the virus, but the communication abilities and technology for individuals to talk to each other, to supplement what they're learning, that makes it so much more profitable. So as I mentioned before, areas where technology is really important, agriculture, food, things that we grow that help us, biofuel, really big form of research right now, corn, soy, algae. Algae are a big thing in terms of biofuel because algae can reproduce really, really quickly. So we can get more fuel, renewable fuel. Industry, shipping. We get stuff from China across the world in days. It's crazy, right? Now, I can go on my phone, I can say, I need, so this, this little microphone thing, I've been saying I'm gonna buy it all summer, and then last Thursday, I was like, oh, I never ordered that. I hope it'll come by Monday. It was in my hands Thursday night. Amazon, two to three hour delivery. That's crazy, right? I can get anything I want in my hands without even leaving my couch. And then medicine I mentioned. So here we see, we don't have much going on in technology, although let me remind you in terms of technology that if we look back thousands of years to get here, to get here, to the industrial revolution, our population was low and so the research that they were doing all along here was really important. There weren't a lot of people, and yet they were figuring out, how do I take a rock and I just hit it in a certain way to make a point so that I can use that to cut food and kill? That's big time research. And the few people were telling each other, hey, if you take this stick and you sharpen the edge, and then you take another stick that's bent and you put a string on it, you can make an arrow and kill something really far away. They left notes in caves, on walls, on the ground for each other. They learned how to use really fine twigs, put holes in the end to sew clothes. They learned how to harness sunlight and other materials to make fire. Fire was an enormous technology back here to allow us to move out of warm climates. With fire and with the ability to make clothing from animals that they killed, you could take the skin, the leather of an animal, you can make a coat, you could take your fire and you could move somewhere away from others. You can emigrate away from your population. So one thing I want you to kind of like in your mind think about is that while we have this going up here of technology, there were technologies that were really important leading us here all along. Again, we don't see the deer moving like that, right? We don't see them coming up with technologies to avoid dealing with us, but we figured it out. So we have something, good or bad, we've figured out technologies. We do have a big difference in developing countries, countries that are getting more access to technologies. We have a lot, makes up about seven some billion. And developed countries are a little bit less than a billion. 
but we're moving fast in terms of our population because these countries are getting access to all the technologies we have here. So as I mentioned before, you all are going to have an online discussion next week where you're going to discuss, have humans exceeded the carrying capacity? I want you to do a little research and think about it. So look for that discussion next week on Canvas. It is open, you can get started now, but it's all detailed for you in your modules. Our technology has allowed us to evade environmental resistance greatly. So again, remember the technologies of people of the past. I always like to emphasize that. So here again, fire, writing notes to each other, figuring out how to do that, building shelter, clothing, weapons. You can distinctly see something that we all have in our kitchen that we use probably every day, right? Look at where it started. So we do get a lot, we got a lot from those ancient humans to get us where we are today. And from all of those simplistic things, we've gotten here. Are all of our technologies positive for the human population and other populations? Not necessarily, right? So this is nice, right? We've got a woman minority doctor. That's great that we're here taking care of a child. Beautiful sunset in New York City, one of the biggest cities in the world. Vaccines. Ugh, we've got the future. This makes me really hopeful. We're gonna see this explode. Solar wind, other renewable energies. But then look what we did to ourselves. We sit in traffic. We eat animals that are crammed into factories. The animals are very unhealthy. The animals are fed or given things that are unhealthy for us. So technology, we've kind of like melded the good and the bad together. It's a very interesting time and if a lot of you are focusing on some of the negatives in this time which is very easy to do you all and this is what gives me so much hope is you being here you're smart you're going to be this you're going to help with this you're going to expand our horizons think about what you can do Think about how you can contribute and let's try to move this world to these more positive things, right? What if you are an individual who becomes a research pharmacist and you figure out the next pandemic solution? It's so exciting. So there's lots out there for us to focus on, focus on in terms of the positive. All right, so these are a lot of the just things that I've already mentioned. I don't like to focus too much on the doom and gloom. Just like survivorship, I like to focus on the survivors rather than the deaths. I like to focus on the positive. I do have a lot of hope. Another thing to think about in terms of the human population is what we call RLF. And this is a really important factor as you guys are gonna be discussing the human population, our carrying capacity, is replacement level fertility. The idea of this is that you, as a individual who may reproduce, if we wanted to keep a stable population, you would only replace yourself. That's what we mean by replacement, replacement level fertility. If you have a mating pair, they should each replace themselves, have no more than two individuals. 
some will choose none. So then you think about the average is that if I am an individual and I choose to have none, my friend has three with her partner, we have averaged out our three to an RLF that is appropriate for our population. We typically say 2.1 because not every offspring survives. So that's why it goes up a little bit. So kind of an interesting concept to think about for the future. We can look at different populations around the world and see that they fit into different age structure diagrams. Sorry. So if we look at our developing countries, we have a lot of young populations, meaning that there's a lot of kids that are born, maybe not as many survive to their teenage years, and then we have less in our post-reproductive, our older population. If this continues, it just keeps getting, the pyramid keeps getting wider and wider. In our developed countries, we typically see these two age structure graphs. We see that about the same amount that are born are about the same amount in the middle years as are about the same amount older. Shrinking populations, these populations here are adding less. So that eventually what's gonna happen is this is gonna keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It's gonna come in. How is there an expansion of people from in the, like the middle reproductive stage? So obviously you can't add someone that's just randomly 15 years old. So how does that? So what we're looking at is this is like over a long period of time is that these are gonna have an influence here. So that if this is wider, this is gonna get wider. So you see that this group is wider than the older population. So over time, what we've seen with technology, that they were older, technology wasn't as good, technology's come better. So you've added, they added more kids, and now they're adding more kids. So it's kind of like you have to look at a top down in developed countries where people are thinking maybe a little bit more about education, not having as much time for reproduction, is that we do see a lot here, right? There's a lot of people, they live to an older age. There's definitely, in terms of density, there's a lot more people here than there are here. So as we've gotten technology, people have gotten more educated. So these group, this group here, maybe they had in, maybe like half or had a formal um, college education or higher. They have kids, more education here. With more education, you think like two things. I don't want to add more kids to the population, and I don't have time because I've had all this training. And so then they, this group is like, okay, I'm going to stick more to the RLF, and you have about the same amount. So it's kind of like a top-down and in reflection of technology. So here's a couple of real-world examples. Africa, you can see getting bigger and having more kids. In Europe, it's growing slowly, but less kids coming in. And in North America, you can see that it's about even there. So this is what we would call a shrinking population. And a lot of people have concerns for the future that if we have professionals who are not having kids and sending them to college, what does that mean for our technology for the future and access to education? And so that's a big focus in places like Africa, where a lot of countries are developing, is that will enough of these kids, while they are smart, will they have access to the education that we as humans need to keep our technology on pace as it has been in the past. And so education is a huge push from a lot of people here who have money to bring education here because there's a lot of brain talent here that's not getting the education that they deserve and that we as a population need. 
So again, you can see some of them, negative growth, Germany, Bulgaria, Hungary, shrinking in size, Denmark, Austria, Italy, it's all about the same. The United States is a little bit, United States, Canada, Australia, a little bit bigger. And one of the things about this that makes it really interesting is that we have a lot of immigrants who come to these countries. And so this is where I, I love about like the United States, for example, is that we might have a lot of people from here coming and bringing here so that these people who have kids want their kids to get that education in a place where they have access. So the, I have, I don't want to get political. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> here's some percentages. This is a little bit older, but it does show you at least that the world fertility rate, it doesn't seem super high, right? 2.5, but that 0.5, when you apply that to billions of people, that's a big number. You can see developing countries are 2.6, so a little over the average. And then you can take a look at this, that just comparing developed countries are below the RLF. So we're not replacing enough access, people with access to education. All right, and here's the world population growth. You can see it's gone up. Asia, including India, which has a billion people on their own. Africa, Europe, you can see the percentage of just the colors of who's adding to our exponential growth here. And then the US population in general, again, we see it going up. We are still having a baby boom. It's just not as fast as it was around here in the 19, like 30s, 40s, 50s. But it's still going up. Okay, I wanted to show you one thing kind of interesting to see. There are inter interesting population counters out there. And so when we look at population growth, I like this page because you can see the differences between births and deaths and how that has an impact on the human population. Our births today, we're in the 160,000s and deaths are 67,000. So we are greatly exceeding births than deaths, which means that the human population continues to rise up. So just some kind of like interesting, I thought, oh, this is a nice one because it does show what we really make in terms of the equation of population growth. Okay, so now we're gonna continue on and talk about community ecology or community interactions. Let's start out just a little background again. Living things are in an ecosystem. Can you live without the interaction of any other species? If you're thinking, mm, no, you cannot. The air that you're breathing has oxygen and other nutrients in it that comes from photosynthesizers. Have to get that. You have tons of bacteria in your body, other organisms, microscopic organisms that add to your health. Really huge, fascinating field that is exploding is called the microbiome. What we are finding with the microbiome is all the organisms that live in and on us influence our health, good and bad, 
and actually to the point that it may determine what diseases you get in your future. So there's a lot of research that shows, I just read an article in the New York Times that said, if you are prone to getting cavities, even though maybe you're a person who brushes three times a day and you floss and you're always conscientious of your teeth, but you always seem to get cavities, there's nothing you can do about it because your mouth microbiome has certain bacteria that produce acid that break down the enamel in your teeth. And who you live with will influence your mouth microbiome as well as the rest of your microbiome. So if you live in a house with other people who also are prone to getting cavities, it's probably going to be you. Absolutely, and that's going to be a huge field, is that if we can treat people with other people's microbiomes, it can actually make someone healthier, or if you don't treat, yeah, so excellent example. They um, are looking at this field of like trying to figure out what are good like bacteria, let's just say bacteria, for example, what good bacteria could help you with a certain... Um, if you're prone to a certain disease, what could they give you? What bacteria could they treat you with to help you not be susceptible to that disease? Yeah, so there's so many cool, like you guys sitting here, I know a lot of times when you're, you think like, I love biology. There is so much that you don't even realize is happening. So if you're just like, I want to be a pharmacist, that you might be thinking, I'm going to go work at CVS and be a pharmacist. Your view of pharmacy is like this when the possibilities are like that. There's so much going on. And um, one of the things that I do every day is I have a subscription, and I think you can get a free one through the college. I'll look into that, to the New York Times. Their science section is awesome. And every day on my phone, I just kind of like flip through the science section, and I read articles because I'm learning about all these like amazing things in biology as you are sitting down in this position now and thinking about what do I want to be when I grow up, reading the New York Times science section will open the possibilities to seeing like what's really going on out there and you might find something that you're like, that's cool. I want to, I want to look into that. So the conventional careers of just being a doctor or a pharmacist or a dentist, those fields, while we think about them like this, there's so many directions you can go in in each of the conventional, like, I want to be a doctor, and I can do this, but you really can do all this. So um, do yourself a favor and start reading, because you might find something that you're super duper duper jazzed about, and might, again, like I say, contribute in this like really positive, meaningful way to your future. Anyway, so thanks for that. What's happening here? Okay, so. We talked about that. All right, so ecosystems, we've talked about the balance, right? Oh, I picked up the wrong clicker. Okay, so, so we know that there is a balance in an ecosystem, whether we're talking about biotic potential and environmental resistance, or we're talking about the relationship between non-living, or sorry, non-living abiotic factors with living biotic factors, is that these these rely on these and these rely on each other and so that every ecosystem is very delicately balanced by so many things if you disrupt even one of these any of them pick one pick a one of one that can have a huge effect on any ecosystem depending on what one thing changes might not be a big deal, and it might be a huge deal. So let's talk a little bit about human disruption. Beautiful, beautiful creature. This is called the lionfish. The lionfish is home. There's about, uh, I think, 11 species of lionfish that live in the Indo-Pacific, but we're seeing this in the Caribbean. 
they were never native to the Caribbean before maybe like 10, 15 years ago. They're not even native, they just live there. So we call this a non-native species. Somehow, lionfish have gotten into the Caribbean. We call this an introduced, invasive, non-native, whatever you want to address it as, species. It means that it didn't live there in the history of what we know. Because they've never lived there before, organisms who do live there don't really recognize what to do with them or how to interact with them. So they don't really have any predators. They can go in and eat a bunch of things and the population's like, oh, I don't know what that thing's about. They have very little environmental resistance. For some reason, they can adapt well to the new environment. They can find a home, they can find food, they can find anything they need in that ecosystem and grow really, really quickly. So I think I'm gonna come back to this. Um, another example, a local example is purple loosestrife. You guys will notice this now as you drive around, especially this time of year when things are pretty well grown. In wetland areas, you'll see this really beautiful purple topped plants. So where you see cattails, which are native-ish, you might see a lot more of this. So a long time ago, I think it was like the 1800s, early 1800s, somebody said, hey, you know what? This is pretty. Okay, people in Europe said, this is pretty. Let's bring this to North America where the wetlands are more brown and green. Let's add some pretty purple. But when they added this, they found that it just started to grow like crazy and they thought, this is great. It's growing everywhere. But then they found that it grew so much that it pushed out all the other species in the wetland. If you were gonna choose a diet today, you're like, I'm gonna go on a diet. I'm gonna eat oranges. Are, are oranges healthy? Is eating an orange a good choice? Right? It's good, right? Oranges are good for you. All right, let's think about this. Are eating only oranges a good, healthy choice? No, right? So when you have an ecosystem that gets taken over by one thing, can all the organisms who live there get everything they need in their diet? No, right? Not only in their diet, but what if cattails and other species help make them homes? So they might be losing homes. They're losing all the nutrients they need in their diet and many other things, right? So this coming and taking over, while it might be pretty, it's not good for that ecosystem. Check that out. Pretty. Healthy for the ecosystem? No. Okay, so an invasive species can disrupt the community structure in many, many ways. I've mentioned some of them. They don't have any natural predators. They come into that situation and all the big predators are like, I don't know what that is. I'm just gonna eat what I normally eat. So then that leads to exponential growth in that way. If they exponentially grow, they start to spread uncontrollably. What if they bring some kind of factor that causes really severe allergies in people? Well, we don't like that. Not just humans, but it could cause health issues in other species in that area too. And what if we realize over time that this doesn't establish the soil and filter water as good as our diverse wetland and our water system is affected because our water quality that got filtered by our nice diverse ecosystem, our nice diverse wetland, it's not getting filtered by this. And so it causes us to change the way that we filter our water. And now we have to add this whole new water filtration system that was natural and free by our old diverse wetland 
but now we have to pay for filtering our water and it costs us a lot. Okay, so it can really affect our economy. We don't think about that beforehand, but after the fact, we might go, crap, that's not good. And then I just add to the, back to the lionfish here. Um, the lionfish, uh, we find it in the Caribbean now. These guys have this crazy vacuum cleaner suction mouth where they can eat 20 babies in an hour. So what they're doing is that they're just, they're going and they're sucking up all the juveniles on the coral reefs in the Caribbean. And if you don't have a juvenile population, guess what? You don't have populations to go on. And if you don't have that middle population who can reproduce, everything is going to start to die off and your diversity is going down. So the diversity on coral reefs we have seen gone down. They have poisonous spines, so they're very hard for a predator to eat. They're super tasty, but this part that's yummy, it's protected by all these spines. So now we have to find predators who are able to eat these in a way that the spines can go down their throat and not prick them and not be allergic to the poison, the venom. So there are sharks and eels and groupers that are trying to learn how to grab bites of their body without eating the spines. And so some fish as well are trying to figure it out. Other, other larger species are adapting to eating them, but also a lot of countries because coral reefs are beautiful and they are destinations for people to come and go scuba diving and snorkeling and hang out on the beaches that they realize our economy is being affected by this. And so people are going out every day and spearing them and trying to get rid of them. So just kind of interesting if um, you can read all kinds of things about them. Okay, so a little bit about community interactions. This is a nice example of a community. We've got a few different species. And so when we're talking about the interactions of community members, we're going to our next level of ecology, which is the community are the interaction between all of the living things in an ecosystem. The interaction between the living things in an ecosystem can have a great effect on a species, a population over time, so that the way one population interacts with a different population can really affect their growth. We saw that when we talked about the bunny and the lynx, right? Bunny population goes up, lynx population goes up, lynx start to eat all the bunnies, bunny population goes down, lynx are like, crap, no more food. Their population goes down. Not many predators, bunny population goes up. Oh, wait, there's more food, lynx population goes up. So we've already talked a little bit about interactions between members of different populations or community interactions. Next unit, we're gonna talk about evolution, but to introduce it a little bit, the way that one organism acts on or influences another one is called co-evolution. One species can be an agent of natural selection on another species, meaning that this hummingbird, as long as this hummingbird is around in the community, and it is going into this particular flower because its nose fits and gets the nectar, the sugars and food that's way in here. When it inserts its nose in there to get the food here, and this is extra food that the flower doesn't need, so the flower is kind of offering that to the hummingbird. When the hummingbird does that, pollen that's inside here, the pollen that has like babies all over it, <clears throat> gets all over this hummingbird's feathers. And so when the hummingbird goes to this flower, and then it goes to the next flower, it takes the pollen, I should say really plant sperm, takes the pollen that's all over it, and it inserts it to the next flower. And then that pollen can fertilize the next flower over here. So this flower cannot reproduce without this hummingbird. 
And this hummingbird's face is precisely adapted or fits into this flower. So if we lose this population, might we lose this population? Right. So we can see that some species, they really rely on others. And we know that just like our microbiome example, we really need other organisms for survival. Co-evolution means as one changes, the other one will change, good or bad. Okay, we'll stop there. I've gone, I like to go over and lecture if I remember what time lecture ends. <laughs>